The Bothy Storytelling Podcast is a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB. Welcome to the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. I'm your host, Callum Lycan. And here we are again, after the most ridiculous break ever. And I can only apologise, Bothy fans. It's been uh, about three months since I last recorded, and I just can't believe how long it's been. A little bit my fault, not being prepared and having any backups already recorded to release. But you know what? I like to try and do these as spontaneous as I can. That's something I'm going to have to adjust. But where have I been? Well, I've been all over. Up and down the province of Alberta. I've even been across this grand country, Canada, all the way to the east. Well, not all the way to the east, but going east, out to Peterborough in Ontario for the Storytelling Conference. And that's what this episode's going to be about. It's going to be about the workshop I delivered. It's going to be about the journey. It's going to be about the conference to give you a wee bit of an idea. But hey guys, there's some exciting news. I'm in it. I don't know if you can hear. I don't know if you'll register the difference. But I'm in my new studio. However, I think I'll probably talk about that a wee bit later in other episodes. But you know what? It's beautiful. It's stunning. It's wonderful. I'm so happy. It's my little cubicle of delight where I get to shut myself off from the world. Hopefully no cats crying at the door. I I don't know, folks. Um, Cats, we love them. But a closed door to them just seems to be an invitation to meow and scratch. They can't handle the fact that I close them out of my studio so I can actually work. But this episode of The Bothy, we'll get into it in a minute. But first, a little word from one of our sponsors. This year, Edmonton is home to Canada's first and only non-fiction festival, Lit Fest, running from October the 11th to the 21st. It features dozens of events with writers from across the country and beyond, all sharing true stories and big ideas about culture, food, science, politics and more. Among the writers are award-winning poet Billy Ray Belcourt, musician and documentarian Dave Bedini, and Michael Hingston, author of Let's Go Exploring, Calvin and Hobbes. There are many more listed at litfestalberta.org. That's litfestalberta.org. Festival passes are $129. Four packs and single tickets will also be available. You can get a $5 discount off by using the promo code APN Rocks. So use that promo code APN Rocks to get a $5 discount and get your tickets today at litfestalberta.org. That's litfestalberta.org. And that sounds a fantastic event, the Lit Fest event. Do head over to their website and see the whole array of authors and writers that are going to be appearing at this event. And it's kind of apt that I've, uh, speaking about Litfest, because, you know, my whole season has been travelling, doing events and festivals. And this episode, I want to talk about the great journey I took across Canada, heading out east towards the little town of Peterborough in Ontario for the Storytellers of Canada conference. As I've probably mentioned before, I am a member of the Storytellers of Canada. My whole life is about storytelling. So I was invited out to do a workshop at the event for introduction to storytelling. So that was fantastic, but a big challenge, how to get out there. You know, I had a look at flying and damn, it's expensive flying in this country. It was going to be, if I remember correctly, about $1,300 just to fly out there. And that wasn't including, obviously, the registration for the conference and the accommodation and food and everything else. 
So already I was like, this is costing a fortune before it even begins. I had a look at taking the train. <laughs> Little known fact for such a beautiful big country as Canada is for those not living here. Their public transport system, certainly when it comes to things like trains, is pretty non-existent. Which is such a shame because it's a stunning country and I feel riding the train across Canada probably would be absolutely glorious. But the trains are few and far between. Okay, what's that leave us? The bus. <coughs> Greyhound. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Um, I've ridden a Greyhound in Canada once. It wasn't too bad, but I was only doing a very, very short trip from Medicine Hat to, if I remember correctly, it was Edmonton. So, you know, it was like maybe less than six hours with a couple of stops. It was fairly pleasant. Got to see Canada or the prairies. Whoop. Um, sorry about the sarcasm, prairie people, but you'll understand that. So, of course, there's the problem. How to get over to Peterborough. And I went and approached my beautiful partner, but she couldn't take the time off. She'd just been a trip to Germany for a wedding. And that's when my dear future mother-in-law piped up and said, well, you know, she's got family in Ontario, so why don't we drive across, we'll take her car and call it a road trip and basically she'll visit, I'll go and do the conference. <sighs> now, I love my future mother-in-law. I love the family, they're wonderful. But I'm not going to lie, the prospect of that initially caused me a little bit of concern. It's like, you know three or four days in a car with her. For those that know her, I'm pretty sure some of the family will listen to this podcast. She talks. She talks more than me. Like, I mean a lot. And she's a wonderful woman. Love her to bits. But bloody hell, she talks. So I'm instantly thinking, oh God, can I handle this? You know, I'm going to have to get out there. I'm going to have to do all these workshops, meet all these storytellers. And then, you know, just the whole idea of decompression wasn't going to exist. However, I'm not going to lie, it was a fantastic road trip getting out there. You know, I ended up doing a lot of the driving simply because I love driving and I love seeing Canada and it was the most amazing trip ever. Uh, we ended up driving stupidly like 12 to 14 hours a day. We got out there in three and a half days. We ended up taking a hotel each night just to rest uh, basically getting in, falling asleep, breakfast, boom, straight on the road. But it was amazing driving over all the provinces, uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and into Ontario. You know, I'm not going to lie, there's some really dull bits. But when we hit Ontario with the trees and the mountains and the lakes, oh, it was just, it was phenomenal. And the car just kept going. And, you know, it was just one of those experiences that was fantastic. And we stopped at various places and, you know, had some lunch or did a wee bit of tiny quick sightseeing. So the trip itself was great. And driving out with the future mother-in-law wasn't actually that bad. Although everyone kind of, when I tell them this, kind of looks at me a bit like, serious? You're, you're just, you know, they think I'm just saying this to be nice, but... At the end, it was actually a lot of good fun and we didn't kill each other. It was amazing. We did not argue. It was phenomenal. However, it did cause me a problem. Canada, I'm calling you out on my podcast. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. What sort of nonsense is this? Okay, Canada is renowned for having a plethora of wildlife, a beautiful array of beasties and creatures. I drove across three provinces. I spent th three days, three and a half days there, three and a half days back, and I saw nothing. Not a single creature, apart from a prairie dog or two, and maybe a bit of roadkill. So I'm now under a great belief that Canada has made up it's wildlife. Potentially once upon a time they existed. But what I think they now do is they wait for tourists to arrive somewhere. And um, they call up an agency and that agency says, oh, tourists, right, we've got to keep the myth going. And they basically pull out some wildlife that they have in a nice, I don't know, wildlife resort. You know, like a hotel for bears and uh, 
mountain lions and beavers and all that sort of stuff. And they basically, you know, say, come on, guys, get in the bus. And they ship them out and let them go for a wee walk in front of the tourists. Tourists get a nice photo. When the tourists disappear, they get them back in the bus and take them back for their evening meal. And <clears throat> basically, they live the life of luxury. Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm more likely to see something like Bigfoot or uh, Okapogo or one of those mythical, even a unicorn. I'm more likely to see a unicorn in Canada than I'm likely to see a bear or a wolf or a mountain lion or a beaver or an elk or a moose. I'm sorry, Canada, I'm calling you out. I, I see through your cunning ruse for wildlife. As a Scotsman, you know, I genuinely believe this is what you do. You're tricking the world. Well played, but you know what? I'm calling it out now. That whole journey, I saw nothing. And what I found deeply suspicious when I told fellow storytellers this, on the way back through Saskatchewan, we saw a moose just galloping conveniently towards us across a field. There was a big barn behind it with a door open as if somebody had conveniently opened that door and released the moose for the tourists to see. So I do think that certain people are in on this conspiracy and some of them I now believe are storytellers. So I see through it. I'll find out the truth of this, folks, and I will let you know in the future about the myth of Canadian wildlife. However, eventually we did make it to Peterborough in one piece after a beautiful journey. I mean, there was not much sight to the lakes. Unfortunately, as usual, I took the Scottish weather with me. It was foggy and misty pretty much all the way round, but we made it to Peterborough. The weather cleared. It was fantastic. And the conference began. And, you know, there's something about a storytelling conference which is just amazing. You get to meet all these storytellers from all over Canada, sometimes all over the world. Like-minded, interesting people all working towards the same goal, promoting the craft of storytelling, developing it, enhancing it. it. It's just fantastic. And it's one of the things that I absolutely love about these events. Next year, it's in New Brunswick. I'm still trying to figure out if I'm going to go to that one. But this year, it was in Peterborough, held at the university. It was great, apart from the fact that the university is so far away from anything. You know, ah, storytellers and alcohol, it mixes. Uh, we need pubs. There weren't any local pubs. It was very far to get a good drink. So that was a, a mild complication, but the whole event was great because what we have is we have um, talks, we have story circles, we have campfires, we have... Uh, con uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? We have uh, concerts. Concerts, yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, good with words I am. Glad I'm in the right profession. We have all these events going on. And as I mentioned, I was there to deliver a workshop on introduction to storytelling. Now, the curious thing I discovered very quickly into this workshop is I had a very mixed bag, which was great. I had this wonderful group of new storytellers and experienced storytellers but one of the things that I discovered very quickly, well, a lot of the storytellers in Canada don't do it as a profession. So I am a full-time working storyteller. This is my career, my profession. A lot of the storytellers in Canada I discovered are what I would call, or what we would call, I think community storytellers is the best the best wording for it. A community storyteller is somebody who loves to tell stories, is still professional, still goes out there, but they don't do it to earn a wage. They don't do it for money. So my workshop already came across a bit of a brick wall because it was designed for professional working storytellers. My workshop was based on the business of storytelling. Yeah, we do a little bit about the introduction. What is the story? What's the story about? Story formula, story format, etc. But the whole idea is really the hustle of storytelling. So immediately there was a bit of a slamming brick wall there. 
So we started the workshop and it was really good fun. You know, we did a couple of warm up exercises, got to know each other, know what we're all about. But within the first hour, things went a bit askew. When I realised that the workshop I had devised for this group wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to be a good formula for them. So me being me, I looked at everyone there and asked them a simple question. What did they want? What did they want to learn about storytelling and the business of storytelling? And it was fantastic because what came out of it was, one of my favourite ones was from the new emerging storyteller. Her exact words were, how do you make money doing this? Oh, yay! That makes me so damn happy when someone asks that because that means they are wanting to do this as a serious career and learn the craft, but also use it as a business. As a storyteller, as a self-employed person, we are entrepreneurs. We need to get out there and realise that it's about the money. I'm not belittling the community storytellers, but the reality is when we're doing it full time, we're there to make money. I think the community community storytellers should also have that mental kind of uh, attitude as well and approach, even if they're not wanting to make money, still treat it as a business with the mindset that there is an income potential here, whether or not they accept it or just give it to charity, that is up to themselves. So straight away into my workshop, I'm like, yeah. And I took my cue cards with all my wee notes on it. And in front of everyone, I guess, kind of tossed them over my shoulder. A very kind of uh, theatrical gesture one has to occasionally indulge one's thespian side but yes I threw the cards over my shoulder and basically looked at all the questions wrote them on the board and what we did is we actually just worked through the huge list of questions that everyone had thrown at me that way we kind of almost tailored this workshop to the individuals that were there giving them the workshop that they wanted but oddly enough one of the key elements that came out of it was I had done uh, an apprenticeship in storytelling back in Scotland and that was the one thing that tweaked and piqued the interest the most. They were really curious about this concept. So we ended up kind of talking a lot about the apprenticeship and the processes and a lot of them were fascinated to learn that there is actually a structure they can learn and develop and really progress in this craft. So my workshop, as much as I want to glorify it in uh Say it was a highly professional and delightful time. It was delightful, but it was a stramash. Oh my goodness. Professionalism went out the window. However, I did what I do in my shows. I gave my audience, I gave the people that had given me the time to come and see me the love and respect by giving them what they wanted. And I fulfilled that. And apparently they really enjoyed it. You know, we gave them something that they didn't expect. The workshop wasn't as structured. It became more of a, really became more of a talk rather than a workshop. But it was a really good couple hours insightful discussion, which a lot came from. And one of the weird and wonderful things that came from it was the fact that we're now looking at developing an apprenticeship scheme in Canada. Now, the logistics of this, I have no idea about. Scotland is a very small country. It's easy to deal with things in Scotland. It's three hours travel time to most places. It's a fairly compact little place. Now, Canada is three hours to the nearest city. It is a vast continent. So we have... Continent? Country? Continent? Ah, you know what? Roll with it. We have so many issues with travel here simply because of the space so to try and set up an apprenticeship scheme is going to be a real challenge. So I've been asked to pilot and try and develop it and see where it goes. It may not take off. It may work. We can but try to help develop something in Canada. But also on the back of it, I'm now also dealing with the emerging storytellers of Canada. So new and developing storytellers. I'm part of the committee for storytellers of Canada that help kind of deal with that. So all of a sudden I went to this conference with one idea to have fun, to do my workshop, to meet new tellers. And I've come away with all these kind of crazy ideas and projects I've now got to hopefully bring to fruition. So challenge accepted. Hold my beer. We'll see how those go.
But the workshop itself, tremendous. Fun, great, uh, wonderful merchandise and sale. I didn't sell many of my CDs, but you know what? The Gruesome and Grizzly one, it's a very specific market, so I wasn't too upset about that. The Viking CD is a go. We're still working it. I know I've said this a hundred times, but it is coming. We've actually set a date to start working on it again after all the mayhem of summer. So that was the conference. That was the fun. The road trip was an added bonus. And I probably shouldn't tell some things about that road trip because I don't know, it might get us into trouble. But one of the funniest things <clears throat> about the road trip was my future mother-in-law's father had passed away and one of his last requests were for his ashes to be spread over Canada. Now, I know there's a legal thing about this, so please don't, you know, I'm not mentioning names. But the idea was we would make wee stops and spread a little bit of ashes. Uh, so there we are, driving across Canada. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this. With a dead bloke in the car, in powder form, I may add, in powder form, not an actual rotting corpse. Um, and we're driving across Canada and every so often dispersing some of his remains across the provinces. And I think it has to be one of the weirdest things I've ever been involved in in my life. And I definitely need to sit down and really work a story for this because I think there's definitely a story in there. And it kind of goes along with some of my future plans as well because the road trip really inspired me really gave me an insight into some of the weird and wonderful of this country. You know, like the giant goose and the huge nickel and the weird Sasquatch statues and the UFO things and all those roadside attractions. And one of the things that I was doing at the conference was I uh, was working with the ra as a radio rover for Storytellers of Canada Radio, something I've possibly mentioned in previous um, podcasts. And we're all trying to develop our own shows. So I got inspired because I always, you know me guys, I love the weird and wonderful. I love those crazy, crazy things. And I love finding out about them. I, you know, I'm addicted to stupid things like Sasquatch shows and, and weird exposition unknown. I love, I know that's not weird and wonderful, but you know, he does follow some great mystery stuff. I love that sort of crazy stuff. And, you know, my housemates stare at me like I'm an absolute idiot when I'm watching Sasquatch shows and Bigfoot and kind of sitting there going, ooh, this is good, ooh. Because you know what? As a storyteller, I've got to hold a degree of belief that this world is still vast and there's so much unexplored areas that maybe there is something magical still out there. And I love that idea. But as a result of seeing these weird and wonderful roadside attractions and there's some great little museums out there. Apparently there's a gopher museum. I need to get to the Star Trek one up in Vulcan. But one of my future projects for Storytellers of Canada is kind of urban legends, the weird and wonderful Canada, all the roadside attractions, all the mythical stories, just all the crazy delightful stuff. So I'm actually going to put a wee shout out on this show. If anybody has one of those urban legends, if anyone has a weird and wonderful story or encounter, do get in touch with me. I'd love to chat to you. It won't necessarily be for the Bothy. It will be for Storytellers of Canada Radio. But at the same time, you know, I might be able to use some of it on this show. I might do a couple of weird and wonderful urban legend shows. But I adore them. I think they're amazing. They're fun. We've all got them. We've all seen them. But I also want to explore those weird, crazy creatures and sightings and roadside museums and just all the creepy ass stuff that exists out there. It's one of my passions and I think no better man to explore the weird than me. Now, with that in mind, it brings me perfectly on to my book recommendation for this podcast. Because, you know what? <sighs> I, I got rid of Audible. I decided I'm not going to 
be sponsored by Audible for my book recommendation. It just wasn't working. It was too restrictive and it stopped me from focusing on some of the books that I really want to tell you about. Um, in line with the weird and wonderful Canada, the book that I want to recommend this time is actually The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings. It's by Jan Harold Brunvind. Now, a lot of people might know about The Vanishing Hitchhiker book or even the story, but this is a collection of urban legends and myths from all over. You know, and The Vanishing Hitchhiker, of course, is a main one. You know, that's a very common story. They're all over. I think we've even got them in Scotland. But there are so many great stories in here. The Hook, the Killer in the Back Seat. Oh, yeah, we all know them. Uh, the Nude in the RV. Oh, actually, I might need to read that one. You'll just, just give me a couple of minutes, folks. No, no, I'll read it after. Um, but yeah, this is a cracking book. I've gone through a few of these stories. I've used a few in story sessions. But that is The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings. And it's a great collection of these stories, these great stories and tales. And it's well worth picking up. So I would recommend that. And that's Callum's book recommendation for this episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Now you can tell immediately that I've not done this podcast for a long time and I'm even forgetting my own uh, formula. I nearly forgot to tell you a story. I mean, how ridiculous is that? This is the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. And here I'm getting to the end of what I was about to say. You know, my podcast, I was about to give you my uh, podcast recommendation and then wrap things up and then it dawned on me. I haven't told a story yet. So we've been talking about urban legends and weird and wonderful things. And, you know, there's so many stories to tell. And immediately I was talking about things like the hook and the, you know, the vanishing hitchhiker. And there was a wee joke I remember being told, a wee kind of story joke. And I'll, I'll tell it briefly and then I'll tell the story. Because I always thought this was great and it falls very much in that urban legend. And it's all about a hitchhiker. He's out on a dark road, you know, the the light's fading, he's feeling miserable with his world. He's got his backpack, he just doesn't know what to do, and all of a sudden, he sees headlights in the darkness, getting closer and closer. The vehicle seems to be moving at a slower pace than he thought, but maybe his heart just leaps a moment as he thinks they're slowing down for him. And sure enough, as the car starts to go by, almost lurches to a stop and the hitchhiker thinks this is great. He opens the back door, throws his rucksack in, leaps into the back seat and sits there as the car slowly starts to roll onwards. Now the hitchhiker sorts himself and can I get himself all buckled up and comfortable and then looks ahead to thank the generous Samaritan that has picked him up. But through the gloom, he can't see anybody in the front seat. The car is moving and slowly picking up pace, but there's nobody driving the car. He cannot believe his eyes. This is his worst nightmare and then things get worse. All of a sudden... He sees a ghostly hand appear and turn the steering wheel as they take a slight bend. The hitchhiker can't believe it. Fear fills his whole body. He panics, unbuckles himself, grabs his bag, opens the door and flings himself out into the dirt road. Fear has filled him. He gets up and he runs down the road. Seeing the headlights still behind him, he keeps running and running into the dark. Now he gets lost as he runs. And it takes him a few hours to find himself again. He'd ran off the road, he'd ran on the road, he'd ran off the road. And eventually he gets back onto the road and keeps plodding away. A little bit more calm, a little bit more relaxed. In his mind, trying to justify what he'd seen and Oh, he was tired, he was hungry, it was all his imagination. But still, he was shaken inside. And up ahead he sees a light of a building. And his heart sings when he sees 
a pub, a wee tavern at the side of the road. Ah, that'll sort him out. A wee dram, a wee drink will calm his nerves. He goes in, drops his rucksack, heads straight to the bar and orders a drink and sits there, shaking, trying to console himself, still trying to make sense of what he'd seen. About 20 minutes later, two men walk in. They're a bit tired looking, a bit sweaty, and they sit down at the bar a few stools away from him. They order a drink and start chatting, and then one notices the hitchhiker and stares at him. A look of recognition comes across his face. The hitchhiker has no idea why this man seems to recognise him, and then he hears him talking to his friend. Hey, hey. Was that no the idiot that jumped in our car as we were pushing it down the road? It's a silly wee joke, but it falls in line with the vanishing hitchhiker theme. But the real story, to move straight on to that terribly badly delivered punchline, which I probably got wrong, is a wee story from Scotland, surprise, surprise, and... I mentioned bears and I mentioned unicorns. Actually, I've mentioned a few weird and wonderful mythical creatures. And this is one of the first stories that I read from a Duncan Williamson book in Scotland. And it's called The Coming of the Unicorn. When Scotland was young, it was ruled by many kings. And each king had his own realm. Now, there was once a king and he was a good man. He loved his lands, he looked after his people, he made sure they were fed, he made sure the homes were tended, the fields were safe. He loved his wife, but one thing he loved was the hunt. Every day this king would leave his castle and head out into the realms with his men and hunt. And today was no exception. He blew the horn, called his men and they headed out on their horses into the lands, riding far and wide to hunt. But today was a good day, for as they passed a forest, a great bear lumbered into sight, a monstrous beast that the king knew would feed his lands. And as the bear saw them, it reared itself up and roared at the hunters. The king was always given the first shot. Pulling an arrow, he knocked his bow, sighted and unleashed it upon the bear. Flying true, his arm and eye were good as it hit the bear square in the chest, piercing its heart. The bear roared in agony and then did something so unusual. It looked the king square in the eyes. It took its mighty paw and pressed it to the bloody wound on its chest, then presented it to the king, just before the beast fell down dead. The king sat on his horse in wonder. This beast had just presented its paw before dying, such a human gesture the king had never seen before. And as the king looked down at this mighty beast dead on the ground, his heart filled with sadness. What had he done? On seeing the dead animal, he looked towards his men and gave them an order. Skin the beast, divide the meat among the villages. And with that, the king turned on his horse and rode back to the castle. At the castle he dismounted and headed in and went straight to his rooms and did not leave that night. The queen was worried for him and asked the hunters what had happened. They explained it all. None could understand what had happened to the king, why a sadness had fallen upon him. The queen said, bring the fur treated and cleaned to the king. We will present it to him as a gift. This will cheer him. But on seeing it, the king's heart only grew more sad for the death of this noble creature he had brought. For days the king stayed in his room, sadness filling him, and that sadness crept out of his room over the castle. For days the men asked 
to go hunting the king refused, ordering them to hunt by themselves. But without their great leader beside them, they were unable to hunt as many animals as normal. Weeks started to turn to months, and a sadness spread out throughout the lands, and still the king refused to join the hunt. As the months passed, the land started to grow weak, the crops started to fail, the villages started to crumble with neglect, and the villagers started to grow hungry as the food stock slowly, slowly dropped. Every day the hunters begged their king to join them, and he stayed in his room, his heart filled with sadness. Years now started to tick by, the kingdom started to collapse, people were dying in hunger, and nothing would stir the king from his room. The queen, her heart grew sad, seeing her husband so sad, seeing him wasting away. She knew she had to take action. She went to the three old wizards of the kingdom. She begged them for help, explaining what had happened, explaining that the lands were suffering, that her king was wasting away in sadness. They needed to help. Long and hard, the three wizards mused, thought on the situation until they came up with a solution. The king is a hunter. In his heart, he needs to hunt. We need to create an animal so strong, so swift, so hard to kill, that the king will be drawn from his sadness and forced to hunt once more. The queen agreed, but on looking upon the halls of her castle, she knew that there was no such animal. The king had hunted everything. So the wizards decided to combine their magic. They took the body of the swiftest horse. They took the tail of a lion and fused it to the horse for strength and power. They took the tusk of a wild boar for a boar is such a hardy animal and so hard to kill. But they did not place that tusk in the mouth of the horse. They placed it on the forehead of the animal and then stood back and looked at this creature with the body of the swiftest horse, the tail of a lion and the tusk of a wild boar. It looked ferocious and fearsome and powerful. And they named it the Unicorn. The wizards unleashed the beast into the realm, and it ran from hill to valley to forest. The hunters, seeing a new creature to kill, every day went out. But the beast evaded them. Every arrow missed. Every spear came back blunted. They could not hunt this beast. So they hunted others. But every time they hunt, tried to hunt the bear, or the stag, or the boar, the unicorn would interfere, it would stop the hunt. Every day the hunters would go out and the unicorn would stop them from hunting and worse than that, it would attack them. Now the food stores were empty. They could not hunt to even bring back a mere morsel of food and the whole realm started to suffer. People were now starving to death. The crops were failing. The villages were falling apart for there was no energy to repair them. The unicorn had stopped all the hunts. And slowly, but surely, whispers filled the air. Whispers floated through the castle to the king's ear. He started to hear of failed hunts, of how his men were unable to feed his kingdom, of the starving people, and the king grew furious. He called his hunters, and they explained of this beast, this creature with the body of the swiftest horse, the tail of a lion and the horn or tusk of a wild boar. It was stopping the hunt, and worse, it was attacking them. Many of the hunters had died because of this creature. 
and the king grew angry. How could his hunters let him down so badly? He ordered them once more to hunt this wild beast. But that night they came back broken and bruised and fewer in numbers, so much so that the king's wrath grew. His anger built so much that he called for his horse. He called for his bow and quiver. He called for the horn and looked upon his men and said, I will hunt this beast myself. Where you have failed and let me down, your king will show you how it is done. The next morning he rode out into the lands, hunting the beast. He saw it. He pulled back a, his bow and his arrow missed. Never had he missed. For days he hunted, throwing spear and a shooting arrow at the beast and all the time missing. And all the time he travelled. He travelled through the lands and saw the crops had failed, the villages crumbling, the graves and the starving villagers at the side of the road begging for food. Days and weeks he hunted the beast until one fateful morning. The king had it trapped in a ravine. It was only him and the beast, and he had one arrow left. He pulled it from his quiver, pulling back the bow, targeting the beast's heart. He was about to unleash the arrow. When he looked into the unicorn's eyes and saw sorrow and pain, and pride and arrogance and all the suffering of his lands. And as he looked into the beast's eyes, he remembered his travels. The dying children, the failed crops, the villages in ruin. And as he stared at this magnificent and powerful beast, the king realised the error of his ways, his arrogance his pride, his own misery and suffering at what he had caused. He was the root of all the suffering in his lands. The man who had sworn to protect his people had failed them. The king lowered his bow, looked one last time on that magnificent beast and turned and rode back to his castle. There, he told his men, hunt, hunt like you have never hunted before. Fill up the food stores, our people are dying. The king watched his men ride out and then gave one other order. He called for a stonemason. And he gave the stonemason strict instructions. He wished two statues carved. He wanted them to have the body of the swiftest horse, with the tail of a lion and the tusk of a wild boar on its forehead. And he wanted them carved and placed outside the gates of his castle. And when the job was done, the king looked upon those two statues and smiled, for they would stand guard of his realm. They would stand as a reminder to the king. Never! to let his people down, never to become so arrogant, never become so proudful, never to let his own emotions affect the duty that had been bestowed upon him. And every day from that day forth, the king would ride out to hunt to help his people, to help plant the crops, to help rebuild the villages, to help refill the food stocks. And he would place both his hands upon those statues as a reminder to the duty that he had sworn to the realm. And the unicorn statues are still there to this day. The king fulfilled his duties, refilled and rebuilt his lands, and from that day on took the unicorn to be the symbol of his lands. And the statues of that beast spread throughout the realms of Scotland until we adopted it as our national animal. And to this day, the unicorn is still the national animal of Scotland to remind us to always serve our lands, to never let our emotions or pride 
take over from our duty, from what we were placed here to do, which was to protect each other, to help each other, to make sure the lands are happy and plentiful. And the unicorn became that symbol, the symbol of Scotland. Strong, powerful, hard to kill, swift as a horse. But there is one thing about this story that I love to tell. And it's the truest bit of this story. You see, as a storyteller, I've read, read loads of stories. I, I, I've read hundreds of stories, some including unicorns and mythical beasts. But the one thing I've never read is that anybody has ever captured or killed a unicorn. So do you know what that tells me? When you visit Scotland, head out to the Highlands. Head out and enjoy the beautiful landscape. But if you're lucky, you might catch the glimpse of something streaking by you. And it'll have the body of the swiftest horse. You might look at it and think there's something unusual about it because the tail might seem unusual. And that's because it's got the tail of a lion. And a glint of something will really catch your eye. And that is the horn on its forehead. Because as far as I'm concerned, the unicorn is still out there in the Highlands, running wild and free, the symbol of that proud little land. And if you're lucky, you might see it one day, running about the Highlands of Scotland. The coming of the unicorn, it's one of the first sort of generation of stories that I first told, again from a book from Duncan Williamson, the late great storyteller from Scotland, a travelling teller. He was just amazing. I never had the privilege of meeting him, but his stories are the collections that I love to tell. They speak to me. They work with my style. I absolutely adore his stories. But with that in mind, we need to move on. And as we have a story theme today, the conference, the vanishing hitchhikers, weird and wonderful tales, you know what? My podcast recommendation needs to follow suit. And as you know, we are sponsored by the Alberta Podcast Network, and they have a huge wealth of podcasts out there in the network for Alberta, a wonderful array, a new podcast joining every month. So there's a huge amount to listen to. But the one I want to recommend today through the Alberta Podcast Network is Makeshift Stories. Improbable Stories, a bi-weekly journey into the improbable speculative fiction, sci-fi and fantasy stories for all ages. It's created by Alan V. Hare, and that's part of the Alberta Podcast Network. Makeshift Stories, a bi-weekly journey into the improbable, speculative fiction, sci-fi and fantasy stories for all ages. And I think... That suits this episode perfectly. With all the weird and wonderful we've spoken to, with all the idea of stories, let's recommend another storytelling podcast on the Alberta Podcast Network, Makeshift Stories. And with that, that brings us to the end of a, another Bothy Storytelling podcast. The first in a long time and with many more to come. Because the studio was now created, there are so many possibilities available to me. And hopefully there will be a lot more podcasting, interviews and fun stuff coming your way. But do remember, we have our Patreon page. The Bothy Storytelling podcast is on Patreon. And you can register through that. Just go to Patreon and find the Bothy Storytelling Podcast, you will be able to register and help us produce, develop and grow this podcast. I think uh, from the last time I spoke about it, I've changed it. I've just made it a flat rate. Um, a cup of coffee, basically. You're buying me a cup of coffee while I'm in the studio recording the podcast and you're just supporting this project and keeping it going. So head over to Patreon and become a patron of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast to help us grow and develop this. But thank you very much for joining me in another episode. I look forward to seeing you the next time on the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Mm-hmm.